Um, I guide, advise, mentor uh, startups here in Fairfield County, Westchester County, and New York City. I sit on the board for several New York City startups. I advise for ERA, which is the largest accelerator in the city, very active in the investor community in New York. And I'm here to build Startup Grind. The point of Startup Grind here in Fairfield County is to bring real Silicon Valley-esque sharing economy to this region. And currently it really doesn't exist. These are the kinds of communities you see in Silicon Valley, what's being built in New York City, Austin, those types of places, Tel Aviv, et cetera. So I hope you really enjoy uh, what we have uh, built and worked here really hard for. Um, Moving on, uh, I'd like to make sure everyone has their, their devices uh, silenced in some way, shape, or form. This is going to be live streamed over the internet globally, and it's also being recorded for post-production. Um, CEO, by the way, is the, the corporate executive offices. They give us this gracious space here. Um, I just wanted to thank Marcy and Frank for providing that for us. Uh, Frank sits on the, the Greenwich Chamber board uh, and is... is uh, graciously given us this opportunity. Uh, we do have a curfew at nine o'clock, so I just ask that uh, as we're cleaning up and towards the end of the event, as you're networking and we're finished, that we all uh, exit by nine o'clock this evening, please. Um, in terms of our team at 21 right now, looking for a couple you know, qualified individuals to help us do what we do. Uh, specifically, we're looking for a couple writers and I'm looking for someone that's uh, familiar with social media, specifically Reddit, the Reddit platform. Uh, so if you guys know anybody or you have any interest in playing that role yourself, please come and approach me or one of my team members and, and we'll be in touch. Uh, so now I'd like to just quickly thank our sponsors, uh, specifically and first and foremost, Google for Entrepreneurs. They make this possible. Uh, we are in a global uh, multi-year partnership with them. They give us a lot of the resources at the headquarters level and that trickles down to uh, our chapters like this one here. Um, also, I wanted to thank GE Ventures uh, for making Beth Comstock one of our speakers available today. And I'd also like to, again, thank CEO for providing us the space. Um, to my friend OG, uh, OG provides us Mingle. You might have gotten a card when you walked in. Uh, we utilize Mingle as a way to help you all kind of connect to each other and understand who's in the room before you actually meet them so you can make the best of your time. Um, I'd like to thank Val's. Wine and uh, Liquors uh, here in town, 125 West Putnam Ave. They're providing you the drinks uh, for this evening. And I also like to thank uh, Jamie Frieda, who's in the back. Uh, if you want to come up and say a, a word real quick. Jamie is a local entrepreneur who's providing the food for tonight's event. And uh, I'll just let her say a couple words about what she's building. Hi, guys. <laughs> My name is Jamie Frieda. I'm the founder of uh, Project Pasta. Um, I'm 26 years old and a graduate of the Italian Culinary Academy. Uh, my nonna taught me how to roll out pasta in Italy, actually, and this is my first summer here in um, the States. So I decided to take what I learned in culinary school and what she taught me and make a wonderful line of vegan, gluten-free, grain-free pasta, which is completely nutrient and vitamin-packed, and it's delicious. So please feel free to contact me. Um, there's cards back here, and I'm also back here. This is my wonderful uh, help, Amanda. <laughs> she makes all the sauces, and I roll out the dough. And we're just looking for some feedback. So please feel free to contact us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer Bernheim, who's on our team. She does a lot of the PR for our events. Uh, she runs a, a boutique PR uh, firm that's specifically geared towards entrepreneurs called Martin B & Company. So I'd like to thank her. She's actually with the guests right now. Uh, so on to what's behind me. So there was a Twitter board somewhere around here. I'm not sh really sure where it went with the handles. and But feel free to Twitter the event out and let people know uh, what you're experiencing and, and the, the time that you're having here. Um, personally, I'm very proud to, again, talk about Female Founders Month. We have a hashtag called, and again, this is an idea of uh, talking about women in entrepreneurship, the gender gap that exists, and as a man, I feel like uh, it's a very important thing because that conversation starts with us, right? So uh, it's making that opportunity available to women, uh, giving them the breaks that they need in order to succeed and achieve uh, gender parity in, the, in our community. Um, 
So now I just want to do a quick startup grind tradition. Um, I want you all to stand up and um, get on your feet, make a lot of noise, clap. This is just a practice run, but I want to hear some noise. Okay, so we got the blood pumping a little bit. We got the blood pumping a little bit. So uh, everyone have a seat now. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna make the introduction. So first I'd like to introduce you to Deborah Boussier. Uh, she's formerly the, the CMO at Ernst & Young. She, she did that role for the Americas. Uh, Deborah is uh, director of marketing. Um, at Management and Global uh, Hedge Funds, Director of Marketing, Global Financial Services, Director of Business Development, Marketing and Operations for the Global Financial Services, and like I said, Chief Marketing Officer of the Americas. She's also held a co-founder, FVP, and National Director of Sales and Marketing at UBS, and also Morgan Stanley. Uh, her education has spanned uh, numerous different uh, universities, beginning with Indiana, New York University, Columbia University, and then the National University of Singapore. Uh, she also holds an advisory board seat with Investable, the Armory Group, and the CMO Council of New uh, North America. Uh, she also holds memberships with Elevate, which is formerly 85 Broads, if you guys, any of you are in the financial markets. Uh, and she's also part of the Wall Street Journal Women in Note. So everyone, please welcome Deborah Boussier. <laughs> and so the next guest is Beth Comstock. Um, Beth Comstock is the president and CEO of GE Business Innovations, which includes GE Lighting, GE Ventures and Licensing, Software Commercialization, Corporate Marketing, Sales and Communication. Simultaneously, role of Chief Marketing Officer for GE, uh, president of Integrated Media at NBC Universal pri uh, prior, led the company's digital media efforts, including early development of Hulu.com, Peacock Equity, and iVillage Acquisition. Uh, 2003, she was named the first GE CMO in more than 20 years. Um, held numerous succession roles at GE, NBC, CBS, and Turner Broadcasting. She's also a board member of Nike, a trustee president at the Cooper Witt Smithsonian Design Museum, and also sits on the board at Quirky. Uh, her education was at College of William & Mary. Please welcome Beth Comstock. Thank you very much. So ladies, um, I'm gonna set this here for you, just to give you a, an idea of timing, and I will leave it to you, to both of you. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Can everybody hear us okay? Yeah. A little, little louder. Hi, Beth. Hi, Deborah. Thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here. Um, amazing group of entrepreneurs and investors and media gurus in the audience, and also show of hands of other female founders who are in the audience today. All right. Awesome. So let's get right to it. The World Economic Forum estimates that it'll be another 80 years before women reach gender parity worldwide. You know, I'm going to be dead by then for sure. Um, a lot of longevity technology <laughs> coming along. Oh, good, good. Um, but here you are taking up not one, but two C level roles at GE. And that just seems so unfair to the rest of us who can barely get to one. Um, but congratulations, that's really awesome. Are you surprised by some of these findings? Yeah, it's a, it can be discouraging. I, I've been in business long enough to also know that it's pretty encouraging when you see the trajectory that, uh, of what women have done in business. So um, there's a lot more to do, but I think we've made great strides. Absolutely. You know, I, um, I'm surprised still that it's 2015 and we're actually sitting here having this dialogue. Um, it feels like women have been talking about breaking the glass ceiling, reaching seats at the table for so long. And maybe a better way to approach it as we go forward, especially you know, as I look at my daughter who's 17, and I know you've got daughters who are in their 20s now. You know, I think men and women together, if we stand up together and address this issue, will be so much more powerful. What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. I think, uh, I think a lot of people have to come together. Um, I uh, have this fundamental belief, having spent most of my career in some form of innovation, diversity equals innovation. So if you're an innovation junkie, if you're a business leader who believes that you are want to deliver the most innovative product, you have to believe in diversity. And I think that that is, requires men and women to work together. 
and uh, it means diversity of thought. It's not just um, having men and women. You need the people who think differently and represent uh, almost, uh, you know, a, a diff have different perspectives, different backgrounds, different geographies. So I think um, gender diversity is important and diversity goes much deeper than just gender. Absolutely, I was having this conversation with some of our guests before we started and uh, you know, just talking about, and it's beyond gender, right? It's also age diversity and really looking at who your clients and your targets are and understanding that microcosm and making sure that you at the business level are representing some of that as well. Right, I mean, you think the investors in the crowd here, I mean, you wouldn't build a good portfolio of just the same kind of investments. You want, you want to manage your, your risk, your opportunity. Um, you need to think, I think more and more business leaders need to think about their teams that way. They need to think about the customers that they're serving. Um, and 50% of the population is women, so you need people who can represent your customers, who can help you delve into the mind of your customers. So again, I think any way you look at it, if you look at it from a financial perspective, an innovation perspective, a customer perspective, it takes you back to, one, you need more women, and two, you need more diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the good news is some of the comp some more and more companies, particularly in tech world, are, are doing something about it, right? Google just announced they've committed $150 million this year to diversity initiatives, particularly in the gender space. I think in January, Intel set aside $300 million over a five-year period. And in March, Apple put aside $50 million for nonprofits that focus on this. Can you talk a little bit about some of the diversity initiatives that are uh, in play at GE these days? Yeah, I, uh, diversity ha has been a big part of the company um, in a number of ways. Um, we've become a much more global company. So I think you'd see the company in the past decade has shifted dramatically just in our global reach and, and having teams located globally. Um, we're a multinational company. And just if you start there, that cha changes the shape and dynamic of the company dramatically uh, when you're just representing different cultures, different perspectives, different marketplaces. Uh, we've done a lot um, to develop women. Uh, I've been, I was one of the founding members of our GE Women's Network, um, and it has grown uh, just in incredible, in incredible ways. Uh, we have tens of thousands of women around the world who belong in, in sort of different chapters. Uh, it's been about learning and development and uh, around networking, and it gives women kind of a different way to express their leadership. Um, and it's very, I think it's been very retentive for women to, to just have a different way to, to navigate the company. We uh, have Asian American, African American, a veterans network that, I, that I'm engaged with, um, an LGBTA um, network. So I think you've seen diversity just become an important part of the fabric of a company like GE. Um, it just makes for a better workplace. It makes for a better, better output. Um, so those are a couple of examples. That's great. You know what's amazing is these big multinational corporations like GE, like Ernst & Young, Morgan Stanley, some of the others, in some respects are so farther ahead because of all the diversity initiatives that have been underway really for a good 10 years at this point. Um, and we're seeing still in the startup world, there's still quite a bit of gender disparity. And that's been surprising to me as I've been talking to more and more startups over the last six months or so. Um, why do you think that is from a, gen from a gender perspective and also from a generational perspective? Yeah, I've been surprised myself. I expected as we started doing much more in the, the startup world and investing and partnering with startups, I expected, I mean, your, your, your biases are sort of, okay, this is a younger generation, these are people, um, that's not true, right? And I mean, so you, you need to get out there and see what's happening is, is sort of my lesson, but one of the surprises was there isn't as much gender diversity as I would have expected um, and I think it's, it's just back to that diversity equals innovation equation and, and also the fact that people tend to hang out with people like them. I actually, I've come to the conclusion, I don't think there's a lot of malicious intent here. I think people are just comfortable with people like themselves. Yeah. Um, and we uh, often tend to hire people like ourselves, people who went to the same schools we went to. I mean, if you're, if you're in a startup, you just have to get started fast. You just have to start. You just grab your friends, people in your dorm room if you're coming out of college, if you're retired, it's people you knew. You just start, you just have to start somewhere. You don't have the luxury of recruiting, uh, you know, from the world for what you're looking to do. So I think some of it is just an outgrowth of to be very scrappy and go with what you know. I think the funding world has been very similar. You tend to hire people out of the same kind of companies, the same kind of degrees. So maybe it's not surprising um, that we hire what we know. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's up to all of us to really work to hard. To break that, to, to, to challenge yeah. yourself to yeah. say, you know, am I am I biased in a way that maybe I, you know I, I you know I think I, I can speak for myself and the people I work with. I mean, you want to hire the best people. Most yeah. of us say I want to hire the best people, and you think automatically that is opening you up to be much more merit meritocratic um, and um, and open. But sometimes you, your own biases are you recognize. I like marketers, and I don't know what to do with someone who came out of sourcing. Yeah. I'm going to be maybe more inclined to hire someone who came from a marketing route than I am someone who came from a sourcing route. But if I'm really thinking about the balanced teams I need, I need different perspectives. Yeah. I need to think that a lawyer might be the most innovative thinker that I can put on my team. And so you have to challenge, I think it often starts with yourself. Um, there are programs, there are a lot of things that companies need to do, but I think often it starts with, with the, the leader themselves. Yeah, I agree. Well, you know, it would be interesting if we did a little experiment. You know how the voice, everyone is, you know, the chairs are turned, yeah. so you actually can't see the singer. Wouldn't it be neat if we could interview that way and look on paper and have the conversation with that actually engaging directly with the candidate? There is a great research, sci a data research scientist, if, if you're not familiar with her, her name is Dr. Vivian Ming. And she's a data scientist and a neurologist and a neuroscientist. I don't know, she has like 800 degrees. But she, she does what you're saying. She uses data to help unlock bias in hiring. And really challenges your assumption of if you could hire somebody who's really the best, you would test them blind. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily try to figure out where they went to school, w what their grade point average was. You would give them a test and you would hire the best person, especially in startups that are dependent on writing code and some of the things that, um, that you might be able to test for a little bit easily. Obviously, not every role you can test for, yeah. but I think data is going to unlock a lot more of this for us. We're able to look at the, 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 the pr pattern of people as opposed to sort of the facade we see. So I, I'm encouraged with more smart data yes. that it's going to unlock uh, and allow us to think differently about some of those biases that we just grew up with. And, and they're not ill-intended. They're just sort of the old the fabric of the way it's been. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea for our next startup, if anyone was thinking about what they should be thinking and focused on. The, the data analytics is really, really key. I agree. Um, Kevin O'Leary, Shark Tank, invests in 27 companies in his own portfolio. He said last week, I think, in a Business Insider article that he realized the only ones making money this year so far are the ones that have female CEOs at the helm. And a recent Mintigo study reported that female CEOs of large companies achieve an 18% higher revenue on average than their male counterparts. So, you know, like the old Avis ad, many women feel we've got to try harder because we're number two. Um, do you feel any extra pressure yourself to show tremendous results now that you're a CEO of one of the larger divisions at GE? Well, it's certainly not one of the larger divisions yet, but uh, we're working on that. Um, I, you know, I, it's, it's a good question. I mean, one, I love that quote because he's got the data to back it up, yeah. right? So I think, that, I think that's helpful. Um, I, I'd say a lot of the pressure I feel is just my own competitive spirit, and um, that's always what's put me forth. I don't know if I've felt a pressure because I'm a woman um, to do things differently because it's like, right, I mean, what else do we know, right? right? We, right. Um, we, we've, this is who I've always been. Um, I think what I have struggled with more than sort of trying to break out as a woman leader is, is just more getting confidence in myself. And I don't know if some of that is historic because I'm a woman. I, I you know, I, some of that I sometimes think is just maybe that is more societal. But um, for me, it's been more those kinds of issues. The pressure is more within myself and, to, you know, working on confidence. Do you, you know, at Ernst & Young, we did a lot of um, analysis around that, too. What, what, it, what do you do or what do you do at your affinity groups at GE to help build the confidence of some of the women leaders? Um, I think it's a couple of things. One, just put people in different, uh, give them different experiences. So take the, we, the women's network. What I love about it is someone can be a chapter president. They can be a president. They can, they can, um, they can lead a new initiative. They might be in marketing, but you give them the, the, the um, organi you know, organize the conference, or, or you give them a, you know, a, a very different run kind of a, run the budget, yeah. or a very different kind of a, kind of an o operational role, or a different. And I think people are able to express themselves in different ways and be seen in, in, in a different light. 
um, they're able to build um, a support group of people that vouch for them. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of these things are just, hey, you know, Deborah, she is really great. And somebody who can say with confidence and experience. So those are some of the things. And um, I think coaching and feedback and sort of a safe environment um, where you can just say, hey, and you know someone's got your back? Hey, yeah. I, I'm working on this. I'm not what I want to be. And you can feel it's okay to say that, and you're not necessarily going to have somebody like feel like they're going to mark it on your, your, you know, your performance appraisal or something. Right. So that's those kinds of things. I think giving opportunity to be seen in different, a different arena, building the support network, um, and provide the ongoing coaching um, that, that people need in kind of a safe environment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, giving giving everybody just a little push you know, sometimes is all they need is to take on that leadership right. role, you, right? You, you yeah. can be the president of, of the Women's Network. Uh, you know, that yes, you can be seen that way. And it's amazing sometimes what people do when they sort of step into that role. Yeah. And suddenly people see them in a totally different way. Yeah. Um, so I often say to uh, founders I work with or companies we work with, you know, sometimes do something unexpected with some of your diver the diverse folks on your team. Put them in unexpected roles even if it's symbolic, just to sort of let them be seen in a different light than maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that had, um, issues that, that some of us bring to, bring to the table. Yeah. You know, you talked about working with some great women, but I know you've worked with great men as well. You, are there sort of markers of key leadership attributes that you can point to that uh, you, know, you would rate as up there in terms of great leadership style? Yeah, I, um, I've worked with great women and great men, and I feel incredibly blessed um, for and I would say the mentors I've had, I, I never had. I felt like early in my career, I was like, oh, "What's wrong with me? I don't have a formal mentor. Like, I, you know, what's wrong with me?" And I realized I had a lot of advisors, yeah. um, and even informal mentors. And I'd say some of the best mentors I've had have been men. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe I've offered a little bit of mentorship to them too. Yeah, um, they've been multi generational. I've had uh, great mentors who are. Um, decades older than me and decades younger than me. Um, and uh, I think it's important to get that, that kind of mix. So what, are, what have I found most valuable? I think people who take the time to get to know you so that the um, feedback they're giving you is, is qualified and given context. It's not just like, here's my ad best advice and I don't care who you are, I'm going to give it to you. Right. Um, so they take time to get to know you and then you're, you have a comfort level and you know they've sort of got your back. Uh, I find the best mentors are the most direct. I like it when people say, you're not going to like this, but here's what you got you to gotta, you gotta think about this. Right. Um, I remember I had this great mentor, and he was, a, he was several generations older than me, and he's like, I, I had a like, nervous twitch or something, I'd like, and he goes, just stop doing that. You look like an idiot. And sometimes you just need people who, who no one had ever told me that, right? No one told me I looked like an idiot when I did that. And um, so sometimes it's just the, the people who are willing to be very um, direct with you because they know that you can take it and they know that, that you're going to try to do something, something better it. with it. Um, and I think the other thing is just a mentor who's willing to champion you who's willing to kind of help put out a good word for you. It's like if you're raising, a, you're raising a f funding in, in, your, in your company. I mean, you want investors who don't just give you money. You want people who are going to talk you up and help you build your network and vouch for you, right? I mean, you're, they're investing in you, not just your idea. And so I think I'd look at mentors as that, too, people who are investing in you, and they're, they're going to somehow feel successful with your success. I agree. Um, do, you, do you think that you do things that are different than some of your male CEO business unit counterparts? Oh, I know I do. So yeah. what, what are some of those things? And some of them I don't know if it's I'm a woman or I just, my brain's wired differently. Right. Um, I am, uh, I'm certainly somebody who is much more tolerant of ambiguity. Um, I'm not sure if that's just a male, female thing. I think thing. that's you, actually, because I would say I, I don't love ambiguity, but I can live with it. So to hear you say you love it, that's I think yeah. obviously it's a perfect example. Gender neutral. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's, um, I, I think um, I, I'm much more networked. Uh, I'm much more external. Um, I, um, I think I am, I think I've, I, I'm a pretty good listener. I think I've had to learn to be a better listener. Um, I, I definitely think I'm, I'm an intuitive leader. Um, and I don't know that my male counterparts are not intuitive. I think I'm okay to express my intuition. So let's talk about that. What does it mean to be an intuitive leader? Well, I think it's an intuitive leader to say, okay, I, I, when you have a gut, like there's just a gut feeling, 
you can't ignore it. You just cannot ignore it. It's physical. I don't know, it's like you're sick to your stomach, it's butterflies, everybody has their, their physical feeling, but it's like, boom, like your radar is going off. And for myself, I'll constantly look for a few markers to validate it. It's, it's a hypothesis, and I look for reinforcement. And I'll use data to just kind of challenge my thinking a little bit, but I rarely will just make a decision based on data. Um, and that's, to me, what I mean by intuitive. I'll take a chance on someone whose resume might make absolutely no sense, yeah. but I just feel the way they're talking, the pattern recognition of this versus that. Again, is that more female than male? I think historically we'd say that so. I maybe, but I, maybe I'm just more comfortable expressing my intuition than a male counterpart. I, I think there are a lot of intuitive males For as sure. well. So have I been allowed to be more intuitive, or more comfortable? I, I don't know. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, way? I mean, well, there's, you know, we talk about women's intuition, right, all, for decades, for all of time, probably. Yeah. So I think there's probably something to it. Um, I, I feel like I trust my gut also. I remember hiring um, this great woman to run our Bermuda office, and, you know, when we got farther down in the, the interview process, she finally let me know that she was pregnant. And so she'd effectively come on board and then be out on maternity leave, you know, for, and in Bermuda, the leave is more generous than it is in the U.S., of course. Um, so, but it was, you know, again, I had to trust my intuition. Uh, you know, I had several meetings with her, but I just felt like this was going to work out. And sh she's probably celebrating her 10-year anniversary there today. That's a great so, story. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I think you do have to trust your gut. Yeah, and I, for myself, whenever I've gone against that gut, it, I, I shouldn't have... You know, it's yeah. just I've counted on someone else's opinion too much, or I've counted too much on the data. And look, there are times your gut is wrong, or you have interpreted it wrong. I'm not trying to say I'm always right by, by any stretch of the imagination, but you have to listen to that. And in business, I found, um, I think there's a challenge to be decisive now. I have to know right now what's your decision. And I've learned to accept that, you know what, I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going to sleep on it. And again, I think that's maybe something you learn with experience, but that's maybe a way I've expressed it a little bit differently to be able to say, I'm not ready to give you that now. I'm gonna, I'll come back to you tomorrow. I think that's great. And that is a great marker of leadership, I agree. And it's, for me, it's taken me the years of experience to get there. Um, that's great. Switching gears back to women entrepreneurs for a moment. We know they're a powerful force in the U.S. economy. A recent report by EY talked about 45, 46 percent of privately held companies across the U.S. are at least half owned by women, and they represent 16 million jobs. And yet we know that the angels and the VCs typically invest just a fraction in women-led businesses. So why do you think women get less investment dollars? Um, I, I, I think uh, there haven't been as many women in businesses before, so you don't have necessarily all the data and the pattern recognition um, that hopefully we'll get more of. Um, I do think it's back to the networks uh, that people have mm -hmm. and, uh, and getting, often you get money from people you know as a starting point or you go to investment teams and they invest in what they know. So I think it's a lot of that I find it a lot of the networks and um, the history and pattern recognition um, hasn't really been there. So it's too early to tell. I, I think it's too early. Yeah, I hope so. And certainly there's, and there was an article today in Crunchbase, I think, but more and more women VCs who have left other companies or you know are ready to invest themselves now are putting some muscle and money behind it. So that's I mean, good to see. I'm excited. Our venture team, um, we have great, a great woman leading it, uh, our key practice leaders, some of our, uh, most of our key practice women are, are leaders are women, um, and um, it's important, you know, yeah. I, I think it's important that if you're committed to, to doing this, to, to investing in and partnering with startups, you have to make sure the team that's making those decisions is balanced. So we're uh, almost 50% of our venture team being men and women, and I think that's really important that's that you model what you're trying to, uh, to invest in or yeah. partner with. That's great. That's great news, too. Good yeah, to I think so. Uh, so talking about innovation, right? I recently left my Corporate America CMO role and currently advising a few startups, some in the audience today. Um, and the energy in the entrepreneurial space has just been really electric and contagious, and I feel like it gets me up every day. And their speed to market, of course, is lightning fast, because it has to be. So, uh, but yet GE, a big behemoth, right, multinational, is able to innovate again and again. So how do you keep doing it? 
Well, I think w one thing, you don't get to be a 130-year-old company without understanding how to change when you need to change. Now, we've always gotten it right. Um, but um, I think that, that it, you, you adapt to live. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, human, it's humans, it's life systems, it's companies. Um, so I think that's a big, a big part of it. Um, you have to go where the markets are. Um, I think that's a, a big part of it. But yeah, sometimes companies get too bureaucratic. You only see the opportunity that's in front of you. You challenge yourself with risk, and you constantly have to break that apart. Um, so what we've been doing over the past few years is, one, just teaming with startups more um, to challenge our assumptions, to help us get to things faster, to help us think about disrupting ourselves, bringing more sort of startup mindset back into the company um, to, as coaches, um, as challengers. Um, and so you have to be open to say maybe we don't have all the best ideas um, and that maybe by partnering or having other people kind of challenge us. So I think those are some of the things that established organizations have to do. They just constantly have to challenge the, um, the, the old norms. Yeah, and be really forward thinking as GE has been for, you know, forever. I mean, we just announced, we're here in, in Fairfield County, I mean, we just announced um, a big change, a big pivot for us in terms of getting out of financial services, right? That's, that's a huge change brought about by a lot of different market factors. Uh, it, it's sad because a lot of great people in the company have built uh, an amazing institution, but you also have to be very nimble and, and understand where the world's going and where your opportunity to compete and make a difference is going to be. So you have to also be able to make some pretty tough decisions. Um, and so I think, again, sort of pairing that, you know, always just trying to keep yourself open uh, to the what if and, and, um, and not be too beholden to anything, except that you want the company to be, you have investors, you have employees, and you want to deliver on your commitment. Yeah, and not so different than our startup <coughs> world either, right? Where yeah. you've got to be, you know, laser focused and understand your niche. So GE Ventures is based in Silicon Valley, where you're spending, you said, about a week a month these days. Um, last week, Crunchbase reported that Silicon Alley is surging, the deal flow there. Um, New York-based startup, Silicon Alley, I should say, in New York is surging, right? So New York-based startups have closed more venture deals in 2015 than their San Francisco-based startups. That's, you know, brand new. Um, and venture investors have committed over almost $3 billion across 350 deals in New York versus seven billion in 340 deals in San Fran. So are you looking at ventures here on the East Coast as well as on the West Coast? Yeah, we're, we're, we're looking around the world. I mean, we've established in Silicon Valley, we have a, we've, we've had a, a pretty good base in Israel for the past couple years as well. Yeah. We're trying to do more globally, um, looking at markets like China, um, like India, um, and um, I, I think obviously you go to Silicon, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but you go to Silicon Valley because there's sort of, it's just a good ecosystem. You've got the funding community, you, you've got the talent, you, you're able to kind of get things going, but I think it's not enough just to stay there. Um, New York, I, I would say we're, it's interesting, New York, Silicon Alley has tended to be a lot more media and fintech. Mm -hmm. And our, the things we're, we're partnering are a lot more on health, energy, software, and advanced manufacturing. So our theses just haven't, haven't aligned. That being said, we do a ton of work with media startups, um, less investing, but kind of early stage development with them in some of our brand marketing efforts. So working a lot, uh, a, a great startup like Percolate, which is being incubated in New York, which is all about content management and data. Um, and we're sort of an early adopter and, and help them scale their businesses by being a sort of early development customer. Um, Chartbeat, another great uh, data content uh, company. I mean, I could name a whole host of these starting companies, uh, BuzzFeed, when it, was, when it was still just a startup. Uh, <coughs> and so for us, I think that's been a way we can contribute is, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> is to play um, where it makes the most sense. Absolutely. <coughs> Maybe talk a little bit about some of your own challenges and fears. <coughs> Once you get some of those ventures on board, you know, and they become part of the family, wh what are you worried about? And also, you know, what makes the successful ones successful? <coughs> Sorry, you guys, I'm, um, 
<laughs> it, it's it's only when you don't need to cough that you can't think about doing anything but coughing. So I apologize. <laughs> the back of my brain's like you cannot cough. You cannot cough. So, um, well, <clears throat> some of the things we 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 set up our venture partnerships. To, we hope to be partnerships. As I said earlier, if you're starting out, you can go to a lot of sources for money. <clears throat> but what do you want from a company? We're not a venture firm. A venture fund. We have uh, equity to, in we have cash to invest in equity and capital to invest, but what do you want from a company? You want access to technology, access to markets, access to customers. You want to know, like, how do you train people? How do you develop? So we've tried to set up as much a, a scaling partnership as just an investing partnership. Um, so I'll give you a good example of the kinds of ways we're working together. There's a a great company we've happened to invest in and partner with called Airware. It's a drone company. Um, and they're, they're providing a platform for service drones and business applications. So we're able to work with them and figure out how do we help apply them in a railroad, railroad setting, in a utility yeah. setting. And so that kind of access to the customer base we have and for us to say to the customer, we'll kind of de-risk it with you. We'll help them come up with the right applications for your business situation. Those are some of how we've, we've worked together with startups. And I think for us it's been, we've had to put the right people in place. If you're On the GE side. In the GE side. Yeah. If you're a startup, you know, you, you either like think, wow, like I can do a lot with GE, or you think, oh my gosh, it's a big behemoth of a company. They're going to squash me like a bug. I'm never going to get anything done. And so you need people who can help navigate the system. Even people in the system who want to help they need to be incented, they need to be told it's okay, that they can take some time to help the startup. Um, sometimes you have to do supplier deals that, that allow people, you know, in your sourcing uh, to understand this is a pilot, they haven't scaled to this degree, you have to work with your sourcing, your supply chain. So, so, so that's some of what we try to do. Let's embed mm -hmm. these in the processes and sort of adapt the processes so they can succeed on their own terms and we don't overwhelm them. And set them up for success. Right? Hopefully. It's mutually beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. We probably still move too slow sometimes. There are probably times when we overwhelm. Uh, you know, everybody's like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, or, you know, the opposite, which is, eh, I don't know. Uh, it sounds a bit risky. What if they eat my business? And so, you know, you have to navigate both of those reactions. Um, talking about innovation and just mentioning the drone company and others, you know, I was at a Global Good Fund event in D.C. Uh, a couple of weeks ago where we heard from 10 social impact entrepreneurs, and including this one guy, CEO of a company called Rugged Communications, who's bringing internet connectivity to um, indigenous villages really across Latin America in a very low-tech way. Um, what's the most recent venture that you've seen that's been, you know, really inspiring? Well, there's so many social uh, <coughs> social entrepreneurs that inspire me. I, we we um, uh, do quite a bit and have gotten to know the team at Acumen, which I think is uh, the Acumen Foundation, which has been great at just spawning these serial on entrepreneurs. Um, um, I, I think you know I can think of um, I, I'm br blanking on the name of one that they've participated in that we've gotten to know that's uh, created um, uh, an ambulance company um, in India, you know, from nothing to create sort of. Uh, emergency trauma care and is really really scaling up. Um, I um, I love people who have bold bold dreams and I, I think what you're also starting to see are is an entrepreneurial mindset that's going into nonprofits. There's a group yeah. we've uh, I, I've gotten to know recently called uh, More Than Me by a young woman out of New Jersey who wanted to take on education in Liberia, found herself in the middle of the Ebola crisis and now wants to bring technology to Liberia. So I think you're starting to see this interesting connection of entrepreneurial thinking going into nonprofit, um, th th this sort of interesting mashup that, uh, that I think is in the next five to ten years is going to yield some very interesting results. And, and um, they know how to reach a startup and say, help me, help me bring, help me bring this technology here. <coughs> so your Twitter bio starts with marketer on a mission. Tell us what your mission is these days. Well, um, I, my, I'm always on a mission to discover what's next. I think I'd start with that. Um, uh, I'm just wired that way. I, I think it's hopefully my job and part of my job in the company. Uh, I'm on a mission to make sure that what we invent has a purpose. Um, I think um, I think in 
business and especially with a lot of what's next, we sometimes get enthralled with doing it just because we can, not because we should. And so I'm on a bit of a mission to say, should we do this? Um, the marketer in me says, what's the need you're solving? What's the right. problem you're solving? So that's really from an innovation and a technology company perspective, what gets me excited is uh, what problem are we solving? What's the need and how, how can we make sure we connect and, and solve that? That's great. That's good advice for the startup community too, for sure, making sure you are solving a problem and not inventing a new one necessarily. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I, I find, I, I, what I love about um, uh, working with startups and our immersion and partnership is startups are so fo focused because they have to be, right? Limited people, limited resources, but huge sense of mission, I, you know, a passion to do something differently. And it's really to serve that customer. And boy, we've been so reinvigorated at GE by being reminded of that. You can lose focus and you can forget sometimes that, you know, without a, that old Peter Drucker co quote, without a customer, there is no business. And I love the, just the purity of, of many startups that that's, that's it. I have a customer, I have a business, right? It's exciting. Yeah. Right? It takes yeah. sometimes a while till you get that customer and you have to have people who are patient and get you there. But Eureka, I actually did this because somebody finds value in it. Yeah. And events like Startup Grind and, and others around the country are great for, you know, networking people and, and getting those answers quicker than uh, they otherwise might. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big believer in the power of a network. Yeah. So shifting gears back to female founders, we have a few minutes left. Last week I... Um, moderated a, a different panel and I was guest authoring an article and I shared the article with a woman in a leadership role. Um, and when my son read the article, he said, yeah, yeah, I've heard all that before, that's great. But honestly, until people's biases are changed. And you know what's interesting is he didn't think twice about saying men or women. His point was that simply people need to change. Um, you know, and I said, yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's why I'm counting on you and your sister and that generation to really start to change perception. What do you tell your daughters about gender parity now that they're probably in the work world themselves? They, they are. Um, I have a, I'll, I'll share a, a kind of um, funny, it wasn't funny for my daughter at the time, but uh, my older daughter, one of her early jobs, um, she'd gotten a raise and a little while, you know, let's say it's a year later, she came back and she said, uh, my boss said that he's going to give me a raise. He asked me, what do I want? So what do I ask for? And I was doing the math. I was like, well, your last raise was really good. And, you know, and, and my husband's like, you get in there, you tell them <laughs> you're worth this, you want, and I totally under-delivered for her, and my husband was like doing the big negotiation. So I'm not sure I'm always the best <laughs> role model in that, in that example. Hopefully I, I you're you know, a great role model. Uh, hopefully you, you sort of, you, you know, you, you lead by example in, in some respects. I, I guess that would be it. I hope I've exposed my daughters to people that show them they can, they can be what they want. Um, and my daughters are right now in business. I mean, I have a writer daughter and an actor daughter. So, you know, I don't know if they're anti-business <laughs> because of that, but I, they're very strong and they're very independent. Yeah. And they're, I love that about them. And they're, they're very in touch with their creativity and they're comfortable in being who they are. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very important stage and no matter what they do as a career to feel confident in, in that. So I guess I'd, st I guess I'd start there and you know, uh, my actor daughter, I, I try to, sometimes she'll ask me for advice and I'll be like, do you want me to say this as your mom or as a business person? And, um, and uh, sometimes I realize, well, that's kind of, I am the one and the same, but um, you know, sometimes the business answer might be different than my instinct as a mother for a role she might be up for. You know, well, are they paying you enough? Or my, the mother might go, ah, I don't know if you should do that role. But, um, so it's those kind of things that um, hopefully I, I can bring a, a, a different kind of lens to them. Yeah, and great, again, that your husband had a different perspective so the kids benefit from, again, diversity of thought, which right. is sort of how we started our conversation today. Um, so maybe one last question before we turn it over to Q&A in the audience is, what, you know, how can we change the ratio of female founders? Is there one thing that everybody in this audience and who's listening in on the live stream can do to change the ratio and make sure women achieve gender parity before the year 2095? Well, one, I think we shouldn't focus on that number. We should see what we can do now, right? I think just, just do it. You know, just start. Give, give someone a chance. I mean, if you're, a, if you're an investor, give someone a chance. You have a portfolio, give someone a chance. Um, if you're a founder, 
give someone a chance that you know take it g trust your gut take a take a flyer on somebody I'm not saying they they have to have no experience or they're not qualified give someone a chance um, give them the benefit of the doubt so I'd say just get started just just get started get started that's great advice and I think that's a good place for us to land thanks Deborah this is really fun thank you thank you, you did that a good job great. thanks nice job Beth. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Um, so now we're going to open up the audience Q and A. Uh, so does anybody have any any questions for the, the ladies? I'm just curious, uh, Beth, that uh, here in Connecticut, the state has gone to tremendous lengths to try to spur a startup community here. We've got uh, business accelerators sprouting all over the place, including here in Greenwich. Uh, it's been a bit of a slow go. Like if you look at uh, Connecticut startup history over the last 20 years, I think you can make the argument that the hedge funds have been the only really, mm. truly earth-shaking kind of innovation that we've seen come out of our quarter here. I'm wondering, you through G Ventures, you've seen a lot of startup communities across the country. Is it possible if you don't have an MIT or a Stanford, um, if you have anchor companies, but a lot of those executives are wedded to the corporation, they're highly compensated, they would be loath to leave and take that kind of a chance. Is it possible to create a startup community from scratch as close as we are to New York City with assets we have like Yale and UConn, and yet it still hasn't happened here to the degree it's happened in places like Austin, you know, or some of the other smaller cities that do have anchor academic institutions or other things going for them? Yeah, it's a good question, and I, I think it's one that people around the world are asking. I travel a ton globally, um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this is just you know hear what's on people's minds, because I do see this trend happening uh, around the world. People are asking that exact question. How do we, how do we make it happen here? Um, and clearly, you need a lot of different things. You need the right funding mechanisms, but you mentioned it. I mean, we're sitting here in Fairfield County with a lot of uh, investment capability. People know how to invest their money in Fairfield County. Um, so, okay, you've got that. You've got great universities. I, uh, I'm quite aware of some of the accelerator and, and invention labs that have, that have sprung up. We've even helped uh, seed some of them at, at UConn. So you have that. You have Yale. You have, you know, you, so you have a, a lot of other universities. Um, and, um, you know, I think you have, it, it seems like you have willing people, so it's, it's a prioritization. I mean, I think the, the, the effort of Startup Grind and, and saying we're going we're gonna to do what we have to do to make it happen, expose people to models, give people access. A lot of times you just don't know where to start. You know, how, how do I even get started? Uh, there probably are a lot of small investors, angel investors, people who would do it at a very small level that have no idea uh, of how do we find a, a startup, unless they're, you know, neighbor or their kid or something. So I think it's just bringing events like this where you bring the ecosystem together and you show them to start small, you don't have to invest a huge amount, you know, here's the ways to start to think about it. Um, I do see this happening in so many places. Um, they're asking this in India. I was in Indonesia last year and met the um, Minister of, of uh, Commerce and tour, oh no, of tourism and in entrepreneurism. So you're starting to see these really interesting mashups and every region is, in Malay I then went on to Malaysia and um, they had created, uh, the government had seeded something like Startup Grind in Malaysia. It was a center, it was a bit more developed, it wasn't just volunteers, it was actual government funded programs to give people the skills, to give them the space, to know how do you prototype certain web things or, you know, um, uh, prototyping hardware. So I think more of the access of those things, um, the government can, can play a role, but it really is the community, I think, coming, coming together and saying, you know what, we can do it here. I think there's a confidence thing that is also in that, and you're seeing it happen in Detroit, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and places I travel, people are saying, we can do it. You know what, we can do it here. That, that's what's exciting. You don't have to move to those places to, to make it happen. Uh, yes. Uh, Nancy May, I have a company called Boy Bench, and we're also starting another company in the healthcare space. But um, what I'm interested in is there is research saying that the number of entrepreneurs is actually declining here in the United States. Yet those of us who have been in the startup and the corporate side 
also know that when we try to partner or work with large corporations, typically the corp large corporation is paranoid about sharing ideas for fear that there's a breach of confidentiality or a conflict. I call it the great sucking noise from the large corporations, from the entrepreneur's soul. Um, <laughs> it's kind of morbid, but it does happen. So what, what do you think needs to be done in the corporate environment to stop that um, without firing all your GCs, <laughs> your legal counsels? Yeah, well, I, um, I, I think some of it is just um, perception versus reality, and you have to have that discussion. You know, what, what, what IP is really important, and let's, let's have that language up front. I think it goes both ways. I've seen many startups that don't want to talk to a GE because they're convinced we're going to steal their idea. Um, uh, they're convinced we're going to do it. And some of them had really bad experiences with companies. You can't blame them, right? I mean, it's not like they made this up in, so, in some cases. So I think oftentimes if you start small, like say let's do a pilot or let's do it in one limited case and figure out how to work through some of these issues before we scale in a big way and see if we can work together and see if we can respect each, each other's um, value and IP. Um, one of the things we've been uh, experimenting a lot with over the past few years is much more open innovation. I mean, that's sort of a cliched term these days, but I'm a big believer in it, um, of a way to open up your IP, um, to give people access, um, to think about ways, and that you, you sort of force yourself to say, here's what I'm going to protect and never share, and here's stuff that, frankly, we're never going to do ourselves. So why don't we open up? I'll give you a good example. Um, this was about a year old, but I think it's, it's illustrative, where um, we were looking for new models of 3D printing. Um, and we had a commodity part that we and our supplier had basically done all we could do with geometry and just manufacturing to take the weight out. And weight was a big factor here. And we said, gosh, can 3D printing make it better? And is there somebody in the world who has a better idea? Um, so we did a, one of these open challenges. The, the punchline is it was a 16-year-old uh, engineering student in Indonesia. And he, he, we bought the prototype from him. And um, it's just forced us to think through these issues. Now, you know, he hasn't, we haven't scaled it up, but it allowed us to think differently. We were allowed to understand how do you put IP around certain parts of these. How do we then work with him going forward? So it was, a, it was a very limited kind of way. And so that's what I've found uh, the best way is go in and find a specific problem. If you're working with a big company, maybe pick something that's uh, commoditized for them, a pain point that they are realizing that they can't take on themselves. And if you're a big company, think about it that way, that way too and start with a, a, little, a little pilot as a way to see if you can work together and open up. I mean, we opened up, um, we've opened up a lot of our patents. We opened, uh, we figured out, we have a lot of patents where we figured out what the value is to us, but if someone else can come up with another application, go for it. Now, okay, yeah, we take a licensing stream. It's not like, you know, so we assume if you innovate on it, you'll pay us a, some sort of a small royalty or something we'll negotiate. But um, it's hard. Patents are not easy to navigate. So even just saying, hey, have at it. We have 200 patents, go to town. Not everybody can navigate them. So it, that took us to, we were working with Corky out in New York to do that. And it required us and Corky to work on making the patents simpler to navigate for different kinds of inventors. So there's even, you know, you have to spend some time in, under, in opening up some of the things that, that you no longer have, have value in. Those are a couple of examples. Um, yes. Just state your name and speak right up in the mic. Sure. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Jason. Uh, Hi. Thank you for speaking, both of you. Uh, so uh, I have a question on gender, actually. So you spoke a good amount on the entrepreneur side, how important it is to have this diversity. Um, I'm curious what your perspective has been on the investor side, um, how, you're, how you've experienced other women and men, for that matter, how they might analyze deals differently at different stages of their growth. Yeah, that's a good question. I. Um I can speak most intimately about the people on the ventures team who I work with, so I know them really well. Um, I don't know when you come down to the hard-nosed decisions on a deal we should make, I've seen much difference in them. Um, but I think in the way they lead their teams, they're very different, but I think in the mathematical equation of how do, how do you make the, 
the, the, the math's the math's the math. And so maybe it's that balance of, um, of what we talked about before, sort of some of the intuition with, with the math. But I think when you do the pure calculations, everybody make, makes it the same. I, I've actually found the ventures team to be very disciplined. I appreciate that discipline, man or woman. Um, I actually think I need to be more disciplined. I've learned a lot from that disciplined investing, the stage gate. Um, some of our toughest decision makers are women. So I'm not sure I could tell you I've seen as much difference in that, um, but maybe in how they lead their teams, there's been a little bit difference in terms of networking and how they've, uh, how they've looked to get ideas in and, and that kind of thing. But in the decision making, I found them very, very disciplined and quite similar. <coughs> Anyone else? Just state your name very quickly and uh, speak up right close to the mic. Uh, John Widener. Uh, Beth, we were, um, a couple of us here tonight were lucky enough to uh, sit in on a presentation last week by uh, the head of leadership and development down at Crotonville, Ragu. And um, obviously a lot of change is going on internally in GE in terms of leadership, et cetera. But the question I have to you is, I worked with a couple of uh, companies recently acquired by a large publishing company that were very entrepreneurial and now are being smothered in this corporate reporting relationship, et cetera. So the question to you is, um, how are you working on that cultural integration and bringing these companies, obviously the companies that you're investing in are companies that are going to add value to GE over time. So how are you... Uh, culturally uh, integrating these companies into the GE culture in a way that doesn't smother this culture of innovation that was in those companies to begin with? Well, I think a recognition that we're separate companies, first of all, and um, if they wanted to work for GE, they would have applied to work there and they want to start their own company, right? So, so I think that recognition that the goal isn't to get them to come and work at GE. Um, and you talked about Crotonville. One of the things we do, we have a, a, something we call the EDGE program that we've created with our startup uh, partners. And it's not all investment companies, it's maybe par startups we're partnered with. And the EDGE program, what, what it does, hopefully it gives our, our startup partners a competitive edge, very, very clever branding. But um, what we do, we'll take them to Crotonville. We offer up the opportunity for startup founders to go to our leadership institute um, together, but to talk about how do I think about hiring and developing people? How do I develop myself? How do I get better? So we, we try to offer up supply chain thinkers and, um, and, and access to um, people who've been doing this in quite seasoned and, and, and experienced. So I'd say that's maybe more of what, what, we, what we try to do is how can what we, what we know make them better? And then on the flip side, I mentioned earlier in talking to Deborah. We brought a lot of um, entrepreneurs in. Often entrepreneurs are kind of between startups. They're maybe serial entrepreneurs, and they come in as coaches. And so we have a lot of um, companies we're incubating. Uh, we're, we're doing one in digital health. We're doing one in um, solid oxide fuel cells. We're doing one in um, on-site power. And we've brought in entrepreneurs to sort of temporarily run these businesses, if you will, to kind of teach the team embed the team, coach the teams on what they need to do. Maybe over time, these folks might want to stay and run it. Um, but we know the wisdom they're imparting. They ask questions in a different way. They, so those would be two ways we've tried to allow people to keep their entrepreneurism separate, but um, kind of embed, the, uh, embed each other with what we know how to do. Anybody else? One right here. Hi, thank you both for this. This is wonderful. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of back up a bit as a startup founder. What is the best way to approach GE? What is the process? I probably, anyway. Um, and what are the kinds of ideas that you're looking for? And what's in it for you um, when you have a strategic partnership with a, with a founding, with yeah, a startup? Yeah, um, a couple of things. I, I think um, we've set up our ventures team to be the gateway. Um, and so, you know, if you're a startup, if you're a founder, you need to do your homework. Uh, you need to understand if your, if your startup is in food, probably not going to work at GE. Um, you need to understand our portfolio. What, what, what we have on our, on our website um, is basically where do we invest and what are our kind of investment themes. So I think you need to understand that even if you're a healthcare company, understand the kind of healthcare we'd be investing in and, and not. Um, so I think you have to have done your homework. 
Um, we generally look, we, we do some seed investing. Uh, our, our investments tend to be seed and growth stage. Um, we find a lot of luck working with incubators uh, in terms of helping us understand seed. We get a chance to, to do some of the um, partnership we talked about. There's been a great, um, there, there's been a couple of health, health incubators, one in New York City, um, that Startup Health, that's been a great uh, funnel for us. So like, I think incubators are really good. Understand any company, what incubators are they supporting? Um, so I'll give you a good example at, you know, with um, Startup Health. We've had some of these advisors I was talking about before actually sitting with the, the startups, being part of the incubation process. We're able to give them feedback, help take them before customers. We get to know them, and so out of that, we, um, we start to fund some of them. Uh, there's a hardware incubator we're working with in, in San Francisco that's helping us do a lot with advanced manufacturing. So I think incubators are very good uh, ways to get some of that seed funding fr from a company. And obviously, we, um, we, we invest alongside uh, seasoned investors and, and venture funds. So, you know, all the ones you would know, we're, we're never leading an investment. We tend to come in alongside them because we're more strategic than, than, than purely financial. So um, we're not going to be your big lead, lead funder. So you'd have to know that about us. And uh, our ventures folks uh, are, are a good way in. The other thing is just to tee up as a customer. Um, I often say, I, I mentioned to Deborah on, uh, on our, our digital media in particular and our brand marketing work, we are just open for business for anyone who has a clever way to tell a story, an interesting way to think about digital activation, um, and we have a team that's set up, set up to do that. Um, so, you know, I, and I think Coke does. Um, most of the brands I see mm -hmm. now, they, they have teams and that, that's what they do, kind of sit between sort of the, the, the ventures and the pure marketing, and we've, we've tried to create that as well. Yeah, there's, um, he'll, he, there's a guy on our team named Andy Markowitz. It's just andy.markowitz at ge.com. I'm sure he's, that's what he does. And so I'd, you know, I'd start with him. Um, you, you feel free to email me. I, you may not hear directly back from me, but we'll make sure that someone, um, someone can, can get you to its best.com, stock at ge.com. We'll make sure someone gets it to, to you, to, to the right person. Um, so I, hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Yes. <laughs> uh, just state your name and speak closely to the mic. Hi, Beth. Uh, Hi. My name is Richard Portalance. I'm with Career Path Mobile. And my question is, I deal with colleges um, helping students to find jobs <coughs> in the marketplace. And as we know, there's a big disparity uh, in the way we handle that. And especially for entrepreneurs, and talking about young entrepreneurs coming out of college who may have a great idea, um, what advice would you give them uh, in terms of looking out to the community for both the entrepreneur and for the uh, institution to try to support them? Um, so that's the question. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, the good news is I think more and more universities are realizing that their students want entrepreneurial tracks. So I think, I don't know, Deborah, do you guys see that at ENY? Did you, did you see that when you were at ENY? Absolutely, and I just took my daughter on a whirlwind tour of college tours, and I'm finding that many of them, that's one of their you know, marquee signature, we do this, so come here. Yeah, so I'm finding, I think the, the universities understand that. I, I do a, we do a lot of recruiting of MBAs uh, for some of the commercial work we do, and I've, in the past five years, I've noticed a marked change of that, where MBA schools are starting to almost talk about themselves as sort of being the entrepreneurial you know, school. Yeah. Um, Wharton is one that's done a really good job and had a pretty good track record. You know, so I think do your homework a little bit if you're, you know, where do you, where do you wanna go? Um, I know we've, we've done a lot of mentoring of entrepreneur groups. I, there's one I stay in touch with, it's a, it's a 3D printing company. And they were at Wharton, that's what made me think about it. And um, we do recruiting at Wharton, and they reached out to our recruiting guys and said, hey, I have this startup company. And they just, they, they, they could tell their story. You know, that would be the other thing. Like, just don't pitch an idea to a company. You know, like, have you actually thought it out? Do you actually have a start of a business? Can you, can you articulately tell your story? Because then you can probably sell it. So the more sophisticated the, the, the entrepreneurs are in terms of reaching out to the community, but hopefully they're finding more of that education at schools. I don't know, what are you seeing trends in schools that? Uh, it's different, you know, we work with uh, Dartmouth, and that's a, that's a great place yeah. for uh, entrepreneurial uh, experiences or, or boosts, but you go down to a community college and it's a completely different experience. And when you kind of go midway college into a really struggling or liberal arts college or into you know, some of the local, you know, nice universities, but those, those students seem to be lost in the mix.
Yeah, so a couple of thoughts, because I think you're, you're, you're adding that on is really helpful. Um, a couple of things I've seen, I, I mean, obviously you've got communities building in, in every community more and more. You've got groups like Startup Grind. Um, I think more universities are having entrepreneur clubs. I love these maker spaces. I'm a huge fan of maker spaces, and more and more communities have that. If you don't know what a maker space is, basically a place where people get together and make stuff. It's a prototyping lab. It's often very grassroots, very um, you know, held together by tape in some cases, but it's people who, uh, the, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time at the one in Brooklyn. Um, I know companies like mine are going to these maker spaces. Increasingly, you see business models like Tech Shop opening up more of these places where you can go in and learn how to weld and make things, and a lot of entrepreneurs, and we created a, a, a pro, a, an effort at University of Louisville that I'm very proud of with our appliance business. It's called First Build. And it was built on this idea of open innovation. Our appliance team, our engineers, our technologists, and the students of University of Louisville, and the, the school helped sponsor it with GE. And we opened it up to the world. We opened it up to the Louisville community and to the students. And it's a maker space. It's a small uh, micro ma manufacturing plant. And people are able to come in there and make a micro kitchen or a new kind of blender and actually see it go to market. So I think you're going to see more of that. But I'd start really scrappy. Your libraries have maker spaces now. So I'd encourage the community, the community college students to look in those places. You know, one thing just to add is, you know, we talk a lot about startups and, and generating something on their own. But w as you and I both have seen in our careers, there's also the intrapreneurial opportunities too. So for college students and others, you know, there's not just one track. You can actually get into a very big, large corporation. In my case, it was UBS, and we had a startup hedge fund group there. And it really was, except we were getting a regular paycheck. Everything else about it was very startup-ish. That is such an important point. It's such a, a key thing. You know, yeah. companies actually like entrepreneurs, too, to work for them. Yeah. And we all have um, skunk works, or not, not maybe not formal, but we have projects. We're all starting up new teams, and yeah. you value that. Do you, have you found the entrepreneur different than the entrepreneur, or do you think it's the same kind of makeup? I think the, the people that are part of those teams all have an entrepreneurial mindset, and then the difference really comes in terms of risk tolerance, right? So if you're in the entrepreneurial space within a large corporation, you're maybe a little less risk averse because you're getting a regular paycheck, right? But in, when you're on your own, as many of you know, you know you're taking those risks because you really want to build that business. So there's maybe a different risk tolerance. But otherwise, I think generally, you've got to be entrepreneurial. Yeah, such a good point. OK, we're going to do yeah one more question. Maybe it's off base, but uh, MBT Heritage, can you share a behind the scenes moment with Letterman? Personal interaction, whatever. <laughs> I, um, I, 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 I left NBC to go to CBS. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, we brought, CBS brought David Letterman over from NBC. That's, I, I was working in the entertainment publicity department. I personally did not have much interaction with him, but it was a very big moment for CBS <laughs> back that however many, however many years ago. And obviously, it worked out well for him to make that move. So that's, that's about as, as good as I can get on the David Letterman stories. <laughs> OK, I, uh, I just wanted to kind of bring this to a quick close and thank both Thank you, Peter. Deborah. Thanks for starting, Thanks, Peter. Good luck with everything. Thank you so Thanks much. Uh, yes, thank you. I just uh, I want to have all my team come up here really quick and just stand up on stage. I want to give them a little bit of recognition because we, uh, we all work really hard, and I push them really hard, even though they're volunteers, uh, to make these things happen, to reach out to all of you and, and put the details together. So if everyone could just come up here. Uh, it's a pretty big team. We're just going to do a quick photo here and then uh, we're going to break and we have until 9 o'clock to be in the space so then everyone can just network and get to know each other a little bit better. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. <coughs> Enjoy. Let me see my two. Oh, good, thank you. ASAP. Back here. One and two. Thank you. 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 Thank